Welcome to the National Archives and Records Administration Genealogy Series, a set of educational lectures on how to do family research. I'm Andrea Matney, the program's coordinator, and pleased to bring you the next session in our series. These lectures demonstrate how to use federal records and other resources for genealogical research for beginning to experienced family historians. Our presenters include experts from the National Archives nationwide. During the premiere broadcast, we invite you to join the conversation. Please participate by using Tube's chat and Twitter. This is the fourth out of six sessions being broadcast over two months. This was our May schedule, and please know that the recorded sessions are still available on YouTube. And here is our June schedule. Like our previous sessions, again, the handout and video will remain available as a recording for later viewing. And as you can see from this slide, chat is available as the video plays. We invite you to participate. First, log into YouTube and then type in your questions. Keep your eye on the chat during the broadcast because the speakers will answer your questions there. You don't have to wait until the end. Please type in your questions at any time. Under the video box, you'll find the live captioning, handout, and evaluation. Click on the words show more to see their links. Now on to our session. From here to there, researching Office of Indian Affairs employees with Kara Moore Labonic and Cody White. Kara Moore Labonic is a reference archive specialist for the National Archives at St. Louis, where she has been employed since 2013. She is a PhD student at St. Louis University and holds an MA in history and a post-baccalaureate in museum studies from Southern Illinois University, as well as an MA in American studies from St. Louis University. Cody White is an archivist from the National Archives of Denver and the subject matter expert for Native American related records. He holds an MA in history from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and a member of Library and Information Science from the University of California, Los Angeles. He has been with the National Archives since 2012. We're beginning our session with Kara. I am now turning the broadcast over to Kara. Hi, I'm Kara Moore-Labonic, and I'm going to be starting off our session of From Here to There, researching offices of Indian Affairs employees with my coworker Cody in Denver. To start off, I'm going to give a little bit more of a background of what an official personnel folder or an OPF is. The National Archives at St. Louis holds more than 100 million former executive branch employee and military personnel records that date back to the 19th century. The official personnel folder, the OPF, is a record that was created during that individual service and it is specifically about that individual. There are some commonly featured items that you'll find in most of the OPFs. Today, we are discussing the former employees of an agency under the umbrella of the Department of the Interior. So in other words, these are the records of former civil, civilian employees. Though I would be remiss to not mention these individuals may also have military service, which we also have personnel records for. That's part of the 100 million. The National Archives at St. Louis holds all of these records in our holdings. Um, we happen to share a building with the National Personnel Records Center. And through the work that we do, we service these records and make them available to the public. The majority of digital records can be found on the catalog from our holdings are our PEP, OMPFs, award cards, burial case files. We are growing our presence, but for now, you'll find BIA personnel records by writing to us directly at the National Archives at St. Louis. The OPFs are organized alphabetically, last name, first name, within their umbrella agency series. So for those technical detail inclined audience members, our civilian personnel records fall under the record group 146 for the most part. This is the record group of the Civil Service Commission under whose jurisdiction civilian personnel matters fell outside of their immediate agencies. Despite sharing the same record group, as a whole, when making a request for these records, we do require the name of the federal agency for which the individual was employed. Here we have the Bureau of Indian Affairs official personnel folder summary slide. We have a picture that was taken, a scan from one of the OPFs of Mary King. You can see she has a picture and she has a nice handwritten letter. 
this letter asked for her employment because she has dependents that need her income. Photos are individually kind of common within the Department of the Interior records. While not all, all OPS have them, and certainly not even all within the Department of the Interior or umbrella, many do. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is the most recent name for the agency that I, we're talking about today, prior to the personnel records being deemed permanent and therefore turned over to us. And that's how I'm going to use them. That's how I'm going to refer to them throughout the my part of the presentation. But do know there are some variations of the name. You'll see them within the letterheads of the records I talk about. And then you'll certainly hear a lot about it from Cody. Um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has deep roots and even deep roots in St. Louis itself, with William Clark as a superintendent of the department from the seat here in St. Louis during his time in service. He actually served as an agent of Indian Affairs through the change in title to the Office of Indian Affairs, which is a name you'll see. Um, at these times, it kind of fell under the War Department, but because it came to rest under the Department of the Interior in 1849, only becoming a formal real agency within the Department of 1947, that's where the records land with us. Moving right into the Bureau of Indian Affairs, as I mentioned, it's an agency within the Department of the Interior. They had a special um, directive to specifically imply, employ some Native Americans with varying amounts of preference and a requirement for some kind of tribal affiliation as part of the overall mission of the agency. These individuals were employed in a huge range from a janitor and a laundress to teachers and agents and even superintendents of some of these schools and doctors. So here we have an image of Mary King's recommendation to service as a laundress. She was a woman with a dependent, as we found out from the previous slide. In 1915, um, it was one of the growing ways in which she could gain federal employment. Women in general struggled to gain employment in pre-World War I federal service, but they had had a presence there since 1850 in kind of post-Civil War era, even beyond you know, the nursing jobs we tend to think of. The BIA provided a particular opportunity for Native women to enter federal service due to the BIA's mission to employ Native Americans. Here, Ms. King fits both qualities, a woman with a dependent and of Native heritage. Here we have a scan of a different version of what we can find at the BIA records. You can find service record cards, which is pictured. You can find OPFs, there's a couple miscellaneous series, um, but we'll discuss the service record card a little bit. They offer a snapshot, a summary of the series of service. The summary is particularly robust in the BIA series. It's often that a service record card may exist where the full official personnel folder either was never created or doesn't exist any longer. This is possible for a lot of different reasons. Either they had very short service, they had very early service, the nature of record keeping in that area and available space before they were transferred to us and we was even created, <laughs> um, may have affected the way that these records were stored, kept, even created. So prior to the agreement for the National Archives to take on personnel records, this kind of, uh, a shot in the dark sometimes. Um, we do know a lot and continue to learn through searching and getting those great requests in about all kinds of different topics. So here, Mary E. Desset, SRC, Service Record Card. There is a seemingly comprehensive accounting of her service with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It lists her hire date, her promotion dates, various titles held, salary, and probably most important to something like genealogy. And we have a uh, date of birth, we have some locations that she was, and including the employment locations. Desette was a woman after my own heart with various teaching positions until retiring to the egresses of the library. Now we're gonna get into and really kind of tackle what can be found in an individual's OPF, starting with Marie S. Haddon. Marie Desette's SRC is an excellent snapshot, but to really get into the content, we're gonna pull apart an OPF. This is the front page of her personal history statement better known as an application, submitted in 1937. Here we can find out that she was born in Pryor, Oklahoma. She lists her race, but specifies just how Indian she is by listing herself as Cherokee 132nd. She offers verification of this identification by naming the Indian roll number she can be found on even, which as genealogists you know is huge. Then it goes on to kind of talk about 
different levels of experience she may or may not have had, different references. The Indian rolls that she references are part of the National Archives collections, and some can be found digitized on our catalog. Not all OPFs of Native Americans provide quite this level of detail and tracking, and sometimes can only be the tribal affiliation listed in an individual's life. But because we do have these things, and they contain amazing photos sometimes, especially for this time period and some of these different cultures and areas and availabilities, the different components mean sometimes the OPF is the only track record we have of these individuals to this depth. So they're really awesome. They can open up a lot more and lead you to a lot of different locations, including outside of St. Louis. Part of the living situations that Marie Hatton would have experienced um, as a teacher in Indian service included quarters, heat, and light. The Navajo agency in charge of placement covered a wide swath of geographic locations, despite Navajo seeming like maybe that's a specific place or a specific area. Um, when Haddon was alerted to her possible placement, no specific school or even state was given, as we can see in this memo next to her application. Now we're going to go a little bit more in depth of some things that you commonly find throughout the record. Um, and OPF specifically. As a rather qualified teacher, Haddon was placed pretty quickly. She would have worked for numerous schools, ending her tenure in the field service for the BIA, teaching at an Indian school at the Cheyenne River Agency in South Dakota in 1942, before she ended up transferring to a different federal agency with the Department of Justice. Employment records can reveal what cultural expectations Native Americans adhered to in order to conform and succeed at their jobs. Records can contain photographs, as we have seen, and handwritten notes as well. We start here from left to right, and we see the field service regular roles page, which if you see in the text in the bottom half of the page, it gives a very in-depth job description and her expectations. Then in the middle, we see whether or not she met some of these expectations with her efficiency rating. This will look familiar as Cody then talks about what he can show you with his holdings and the different kind of things that are available at some of the field sites. And then finally, we have something that will be familiar to most federal employees, especially in this day and age. That's an SF-50, a standard form 50, which provides the different pay changes and title changes and location changes that a federal employee experiences. SF-50 used to look quite a bit different, but this is one out of her, um, out of Haddon's OPF. So now to get into like the depths of Haddon's record and some of the things that are really cool about hers, we can see how the OPF builds the story of the individual over their time in service. Um, these are specific bits that point to different other holdings as well. So on the left, we see a negative image of a newspaper clipping. It discusses Hem's institutional progress when she was a county superintendent with an Oklahoma primary education system and BA in teaching. So she was really an accomplished individual. Um, a great quote that I'm gonna pull out because I know it's a little bit difficult to read. Every child in Mays County should have the best chance possible for a happy, full life, and every bit of education that he is capable of receiving and using to an advantage. So as she's speaking as a county and superintendent at this point, and really you get the philosophy of her life from that, which I think is so enriching, and it tells so much more about, you know, for the genealogy people, who this individual was, and it also, you know, for researchers in a more broad sense, is an amazing snapshot into some of the values of the time. Maybe she's an incredible individual. Maybe she's got some shared values. Um, we also have some additional application pages required for BI applicants there in the middle on the bottom. We also have some additional education that she pursued. Um, she specifically was going to Sherman Institute in Riverside, where we also have a national archive. And you can see some of the courses that she took over the summer, taking advantage of what she could kind of manipulate to her advantage, you know, as a BIA teaching employee, you know, she was able to really excel and continue her outside um, education. We also see on the right hand side, uh, some of her background and specifically, I've pulled out a section in the middle about her background in Oklahoma and her knowledge of their quote unquote people. 
And um, of course, we know Oklahoma does not only have one people, they don't even have just one Native American people. So um, we can kind of get some glimpses into the context of the time as well through the kinds of letters like these that she's writing. Now we're going to move on and see the different kinds of opportunities that she has had with her career. We've got these two images here. There is a long precedent for women seeking federal employment, as I mentioned earlier. And when they were seeking this federal employment, they very often wrote to congressmen to try and get favor or recommendation into federal service. Apparently, however, by 1939, the Department of the Interior didn't appreciate these kind of outreach efforts. Here we can see Haddon takes a transfer from Window Rock, Arizona to Cheyenne, Oklahoma, and we get some insight into some of her required living conditions. Previously stated, they, the agencies were providing some of the like heat, light, shelter, quarters areas, but with this came additional responsibilities that included looking after some of the students. So she's really got a multi-pronged approach to what, what it really means to be a teacher for her in these specific conditions. Um, the schools began integrating dormitories and that was kind of a requirement of student living, probably a requirement of the assimilation goals. Um, and these efforts were to really make the students who were attending the Indian schools separate from the non-assimilating influences back home. They could stay here. They also required teachers to house in the dorms and provide oversight to the students that were there. Not all existing teachers seem to be interested in this arrangement, and this is where Haddon has been able to step in, excel, because she was able to see the advantages or whether to herself or to her community. But it did allow her some movement opportunities and some ability to move into some more areas. So now we look at some of the things that like aren't super common to be found in OPFs. Um, we can see that the education slip is something that I personally have not seen in a ton of um, the BIA OPFs. They, the outside education, especially to this depth where it's listing, you know, what school they went to, where it was, the different courses, the different marks they received, those grades, those little pieces are awesome because they can lead you to, like I said, you know, Riverside, we have an archive there. They can lead you to some of the different institutions and you can learn more about these school programs and about these individuals, how they continued their employment and lived their lives in a really more personal way. Here in the middle, we have a, uh, excerpt taken from the prior Jeffersonian, and it's just a summary of her accomplishments, really. She was uh, written about and bragged about a little bit, which is awesome to see, especially in a third-party journal article, and obviously the Department of the Interior thought that it was important enough to pull and put into her OPF and really keep tabs on the kinds of people that they were employing. And then on the right is something that I think is really unique and special when we're looking at the context of the community, because this is a recommendation request letter. So somebody from the Bureau of Indian Affairs is writing to Haddon, and they're asking for her recommendation because they have a new hire who has listed her as a reference. And so you get like, you get the new hire's name, you get the fact that Haddon has some kind of you know, standing and the BIA is able to write it to her as an employee and say, what do you think? You've been asked for a reference. We actually pull references. So that's an awesome look into the context of the whole community to see like she is a valued member, at least to some extent. And through this, you get the context and the breadth of the way that their community was working together. So now we get a little bit of a reveal into where the OPF can start to lead to some other places. We've got a little before and after here. The image on the left is Haddon's resignation letter, which is lovely. Uh, I wish you all a happy Christmas and may the new year hold, uh, let's see, hold much happiness, which I think is just very delightful. It's a full letter of resignation that's got a nice letterhead on it that's very clear. You can see this is where she goes. Um, there in the middle uh, is the letter where she writes in and I have pulled out this full list of other places that she has worked 
that she lists as references. This will be familiar again as we track kind of who she is and where she goes and where she has come from, which is available in some other areas as well. And then on the right, we actually have a piece from um, an individual who we talked about earlier. Uh, you can see that there's a name change and sometimes that's so, so helpful in the OPFs that we can see that there's there's a, a line traced as this individual carries through their whatever lives they're living. And the name change, especially for women, as most researchers know at this point, can really be a stopping point if we don't have that through line that shows before name, after name. Sometimes these records don't have quite as much biographical information to where we can really confirm, yes, this is a person I'm looking for, or maybe the researcher is starting and they're like, I, I don't know that information yet. That's why I'm writing to you, which you know, then we're like, oh, I think this is maybe the person you're looking for. We are not, we can't make that judgment call, certainly. But then we get these amazing little pieces that help us show, oh, okay, we do know this is a person because we know that there's the specific name change that happens. So when we find those pieces, it gives us that really good before and after, leads us through, helps us find more records, maybe, you know, Maybe we're starting with the name Kirkaldi, maybe we're starting with the name King, then we can kind of go before and after with that and get the whole breadth that is available. So now that we have figured out all of the pieces, how we can pull them out, how we can utilize them, what do you need to move from here to there? Uh, first, I have a summary of what you need to write to me to us at the National Archives at St. Louis. You can write a written request and put it in the mail. You can email us, that's actually preferred. Right now we are only working emergency cases because we are live from COVID, but we are assembling all of the requests that we receive and we will work them in the order received as we can get to them, which is kind of always the rule. So uh, to write us a request, there's certain basic information that we need to even start. As I mentioned at the beginning, our records are organized alphabetically. So we need a full name used during employment. Middle name is a main name because there are certainly a lot of Mary Kings even. And then maiden name, if you have it, if it's applicable, that's always gonna help us make sure that we are getting every piece we can for you. Date of birth helps us make sure we're looking at the right person. Name of employing federal agency, we can't even go start to look until we know that because they're organized by that umbrella. And then the beginning and ending dates of federal service, that's very important because as we know, it, things like the Office of Indian Affairs has moved from the War Department to the Department of the Interior. So having that time frame helps us figure out where we can pull it out. And then we have some letters here that show, you know, different schools within the same system, different administrators are named. And then on the right, we have um, another request for employment within the Oklahoma system. So we're moving from here to there. We're pulling out these pieces. We're looking at, we, we know what individual we want to start with. And then through the record, we find all these little trails that might lead you to Denver. And thank you, Kara, and welcome everyone now to Denver, where I'm presenting from. I hope you're all staying safe and sane out there. We're recording live. We were here and now we're there from St. Louis. That worked better in my mind. Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, earlier named the Office of Indian Affairs, it operated jurisdictions across the West, here seen on this 1935 map from our cartographic branch. So there are a multitude of places a staffer could have worked at. The earliest were factories, very early 1800s that facilitated training. Then came the Indian agents, people assigned to a specific tribe, and they could be solitary or they could have a staff as a need arose. Uh, in many cases, these were army officers, so you could go in that research direction in our DC facility if that was the case, but we won't be diving into military records today. The agents reported to superintendents, who then reported to the commissioner. As the 1800s came to a close, Indian agencies were firmly established at each reservation, as well as at the off-reservation schools where a host of employees could be found. Uh, superintendents, assistants, clerks, mechanics, carpenters, blacksmiths, police, teachers, nurses, stockmen. These agencies continue through today, um, now with regional offices put back in place to oversee the agencies that brought a new host of positions in the 20th century and into today. So let's first go back to Ms. Haddon, one of Kara's examples. 
She provides an interesting case because as a Cherokee, her early life is also reflected in our holdings. Unlike some collections here at the National Archives, the BIA records have a distinct human side, chronicling a peoples from birth to death. So vital records, school records, probate records are normal to find, uh, depending on the various reservation superintendents and their record keeping. As a Cherokee in the Indian Territory before Oklahoma statehood, Haddon is part of the famed Dawes Rolls and is found in those records, uh, an example seen here from our Fort Worth facility. So if you're looking at an individual who is also native, look at the agency records from when they were born and raised for possible information on their early years. So we recall back to her list of duty stations. Uh, she started early on at the Window Rock, Arizona on the Navajo Nation. Now, when building this presentation, I, uh, I cringed a bit at that because despite the immense size of the res and the many BIA offices there, the records can be a bit sparse, uh, especially for the day schools. Added to that is that the Navajo records are split because of our National Archives regions. Uh, those coming from the Arizona side are in Riverside and those in the New Mexico side here in Denver. That said, say you reach out to both and here in Denver, we do have one thin file on her work found in a general administrative series. In this case, mostly to deal with her appointment and then lobbying for a boarding school job, which as Kara showed, Haddon did get up in South Dakota. This isn't completely unusual to have a file just for one person. And they have them for a variety of reasons. If they're employees or if they had land issues, legal issues, anything where an amount of records was generated on a particular person. I, I can think of another Navajo related one. There's a young, uh, young artist who was a Marine in World War II and a book publisher was trying to get a hold of him during the war to get him his royalties. and That created its own file. I can't say if these were intended to be permanent given the randomness at times of who and what was covered, but whatever the reason, some of these cases have survived. So Haddon worked in South Dakota which along with all BIA records from the Dakotas are found at our Kansas City facility. So if you want to fully flesh out her service, you would then visit Kansas City and dive into the records. Uh, generally boarding schools were much more documented than the day schools. So there are probably some gems to be found concerning Haddon or written by Haddon herself there. And then you might take a look at the BIA headquarter records at our flagship Washington DC location. Here's an excerpt from an inspection report submitted to the Indian Service Commissioner that directly mentions Haddon from her tenure in South Dakota. Inspections, annual reports, both statistical and narrative, along with general correspondence on issues and whatnot were sent in. So while annual reports were often vague and rarely mention individuals, but useful for overall activities, and they sometimes include great photographs, Inspection reports are usually filled with the names of whom the inspector met, checked in on, interviewed. So one may find direct records from or to an individual in DC. And many of these sort of records are digitized, uh, were microfilmed, now being digitized and being put into our online catalog, which I'll talk a bit more about at the end. So before we go over the types of records you might find associated with an employee, let's touch a bit on how they're filed. And we'll continue to use Haddon's example as school employees. If we don't have a file specifically marked with an individual's name, you'll have to dig more into the general records. In some cases, there are dedicated series simply called school correspondence or school reports or something along those lines. Then in other cases, they may be in these massive general administrative collections organized by topic under a numerical, alphabetical, or early on simply a chronological filing system. When the decimal filing system was formalized in 1926, educational topics were placed in the 800s, ranging from 800 to 899. So for example, 801 covered attendance reports, 820 was rules and regulations, 840 was conferences, you know, just to name a few. So depending on what the employee did, whether they were a teacher, a matron, a police officer, that would guide you to the area of the records dealing with that topic. It's also important to note that differing agencies means differing records saved. So what might be found in the Wind River Agency files in Wyoming might be different than what the White River Agency in Minnesota saved, uh, at least until records management was better standardized in mid-century. So let's take a look at what possibly, emphasis on possibly, can be found. 
the biggest is simply correspondence. Some types of employees wrote more than others. Uh, superintendents wrote volumes. Uh, superintendents were the sort of managers at each reservation agency. Up until around 1907, these letters were organized chronologically, then after usually by the filing system of some sort that we discussed earlier. Going back to one of Kara's first slides, uh, the list of duty stations for teacher Mary Desset. Here we find letters in the Pueblos agency records she wrote as a teacher on a variety of topics seen here. In these cases, knowing the date of service is key to then know what date span of the letters to browse. Then you'll need to brush up on your cursive writing, as you can see, which is kind of like a skill unto itself. It's, it's a bit like code breaking. You know, we, we often paint cursive as this, as this elegant writing form, but often it's horribly messy. It's letters left out or just denoted by a simple hump in a straight line. And every writer has their own style. So you sort of memorize how they approach letters. And then you sort of look at the text in a distant way and let your brain fill in the letters and then you kind of make it up. But anyway, that, that's a side tangent. Using this set again, uh, here we see examples of her listed in employee rosters. Both of these examples noting employees at the Santa Fe Indian School, and in the case of the ledger, additional notes such as pay and birthplace. We learned Desette was born in Canada. These are great for employees to see exactly what their role was at one particular time and their intersectionality with other employees. And the rosters go back a long ways. Uh, a common thread in BIA records is money, what things cost, what they're paying. So even the earliest records uh, here from 1858, a list of employees in the then far flung territory of Washington and their salaries, along with some basic bio information. These come out of the superintendency records, which were jurisdictions loosely modeled on territories or several territories that encompassed many individual Indian agents. And the superintendent then reported to the commissioner. The superintendencies started in the 1820s and ended in the 1870s. So these and the commissioner's correspondence collections are vital for research because records from individual Indian agents were deemed to be personal property up until 1875. So these massive series might be all there is of individual Indian agents, what they sent in or wrote. Again, organized by date, we're slowly getting these massive, massive microfilm series digitized and placed into our online catalog. So back to this record here, we see the names listed of the Indian agent, uh, his assistant, native interpreter, a laborer. These folks predate the OPFs that Kara mentioned, so this record is doubly valuable. So echoing the personnel files, <clears throat> efficiency reports and evals can be sometimes found in administrative records. These provide details about service as well as anecdotes and in some cases, strange asides that I believe were to speak to professional advancement, uh, such as magazines the employees subscribed to or books they had read. Um, a quick note, quick note here, as with any research in individuals, things you find aren't always gonna be the most glowing. So bear that in mind, uh, especially if you're researching a, a beloved ancestor. So we touched on inspections earlier in those reports sent to the commissioner, but more local mundane ones can be found. And these more flesh out the work an employee did. Here are some school related ones. The students taught, the conditions of the classroom, what was taught, how things were taught. Medical staff created similar records, even stockmen and mechanics and the like created similar records within their duties. Photographs, right now in record group 75, the BIA records, we have just about 20,000 scanned photographs scanned and available online in our catalog. And that number will continue to grow. And within those is sometimes photographs of BIA personnel, which incidentally is a topic one can browse those digitized photographs in our new website. We debuted this new site last fall where our BIA photographs can be searched by keyword, browsed by state, tribal nation, or one of the few dozen topics of which personnel is one. Um, do note these photographs uh, were often poorly, if at all, captioned. So sort of on the topic of photographs in specific regards to researching BIA educational personnel, annuals, you know, school annuals can sometimes be found in our holdings. Here we see examples uh, from Alaska and New Mexico. Many of these are found at our various facilities and they have been digitized um, in some cases and put into our online catalog. For example, uh, Fort Worth has done a bunch from their schools, and these can really help flesh out an employee's tenure at a particular school. 
So yeah, photographs, maps, diagrams, a host of records can help researchers actually see, you know, like visualize where and how a person worked. Um, here we see an aerial shot of the government facilities at the Fort Berthoud Res and a classroom diagram, a very early drawing from when the Miami were still in Kansas. I believe this is from 1861 and it's from our cartographic branch. Again, using a BIA educator as an example, this slide is a bit of a catch-all uh, of just more mundane records one can find created by an employee or about an employee. Leave slips for vacation or illness, uh, ancillary reports such as reports you know, for the promotion of students, seen here again with yet you know, more correspondence, always us on a variety of topics. So how do you do your own research? Records created by or about an employee can be found in nearly every National Archives facility from coast to coast, from Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. to Commodore Drive in San Bruno, California. So to begin, as I keep bringing up, our online catalog is useful. As we have seen throughout this talk, for actual records scanned and found there, for learning what record series exist, or where records are at, and it can be searched by keyword or by creating agency or by date or by record group, NARA facility, a host of search options. So feel free to play around at catalog.archives.gov. Now for most of our records and the research avenues I uh, mentioned today, one will need to visit in person at a National Archives location and really dig into the records as very little is digitized and available online and the work needed to go through folders is beyond what our staff can do for the public. And that's the rest of the story. Thank you so much, both of you. Phenomenal. So I'm going to wrap this up. Um, although we are in the video, wrapping up the video portion of the broadcast, we will continue to take your questions in the chat for another 10 minutes. Please stay if you are watching during the premiere broadcast. But after June 1st, submit questions to inquire at nara.gov. And as a reminder, the presentation's video recording and handout will remain available on this YouTube page. We value your opinion, so please take a minute to complete a short evaluation. Find the link under Show More. Please note that this event is part of the Know Your Records program. And before ending, we really want to share our gratitude for the behind the scenes staff. Uh, our second ch YouTube chat moderator is Amber Forrester. Our audiovisual staff include Jamie Atkinson, Brian Sipperly, Julie Reed, Jason Winston, and Alexis Van Dyke. And today's captioning writer is Brandy Kent. Thank you all. And on behalf of the National Archives, thank you for joining us. Please stay if you have questions and submit them in the chat.